Many of you here will recall that I gave an address to this congregation at the beginning of October where I shared the priorities we're working towards as we prepare for a new dean. And those priorities were pastoral care, communication, finance, and the land sale. And we are making progress in all those areas. But as, as I also said in that address, today we are thinking about finance and that part of our income which comes from con congregational giving. And although our finances are still on a knife edge, today's presentation is not about all of us meeting the costs of running the cathedral. No cathedral congregation can ever do that. And we are working on all our income streams. We're particularly grateful to the Friends of the Cathedral and the Music Development Foundation for increasing their grants to us, let alone the hard work of our staff and volunteers uh, and all those in the events and fundraising teams. We're already grateful for what is regularly given by our congregations in financial giving and, of course, in time and talents as well. But we make no apologies today that we're talking about money and that giving back to God some of what he's given to us is a significant part of Christian commitment. We used to do this renewal of giving exercise regularly and the plan is to do it annually in future. You're about to hear a presentation from some members of the Renewal of Giving team, but I want to thank them all for the work they've been doing over the past months leading to this morning's presentation. Anne Bourne, Barry and Graham Norton, and Canon and Chris, all supported by Charles Martin. And in a moment, Anne will speak about our belonging together. Chris will help us think about the church's teaching on Christian giving, and Graham will then outline the mechanics of giving to the cathedral. Anne. And my husband Stephen and I have been coming to the cathedral since our son was invited to join the choir in 1998. At the time, I was overwhelmed by this place. Its size and grandeur, the robes and candles, and the beauty of the musical offering that our little boy was a part of. It was a far cry from my Presbyterian upbringing in small town Ohio. Our family all committed to worshiping here at that time. Our girls became servers, attended Sunday school, read at services, and later went to youth group. Stephen and I joined the stewards. I volunteered for the school's program, and in time, this became our home church into which we have poured our love, time, and some of our money. We have shared a purpose within a Christian context with those we meet each time we walk into this place. The cathedral has its own congregations, but also has a role of the Mother Church of the Diocese and of our local community. This is the place where the county gathers to celebrate, honor, mourn, and contemplate. I wonder where else we could gather in large numbers to celebrate a new bishop, pray for a lost monarch and her successor, ordain new priests, and celebrate the birth and resurrection of Jesus. And my goodness, don't we do these sorts of things well. This cathedral is at the beginning of a major transition. We hope into a new and brighter future. It will not be easy. Some of the income streams we had been expecting a few years ago have not materialized, partly due to COVID, partly to the recent planning decision. In hindsight, we now see that we were too confident that all would come together into a balanced budget. We must work very hard to turn this situation around including building upon your knowledge and your support. We must also ensure our relevance to a wider population and those exploring Christianity. 
our congregation is slowly growing and changing as we embrace with love more people as they come through our doors, bringing their faith, talents, ideas, and resources. We will need to trust one another during this transition and do our best to hand on to a new dean a cathedral ready to meet tomorrow with hope, faith, and confidence. If we love this place, we cannot be complacent. We cannot wait until some future date to take action, make a contribution, or volunteer new ideas for recovery. We might say to ourselves, God will provide. Well, God has given us Stuart as our acting dean. God has given us this place, this inspirational music, the experience and dedication of our clergy, office, and volunteer teams, and our own collective intelligence and energy. It's up to us what we'll do with that. I pledge to you <clears throat> that as a member of chapter, I will do all in my power to ensure that every penny brought in will be carefully spent as we seek to return to a stable financial footing. I'm more convinced than ever that we need to commit ourselves in whatever way we can, not just to the survival of this cathedral, but to its long-term flourishing. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I'm Chris Hollingshurst. I've been part of the clergy team for, to my surprise, almost three years now. I don't have a fraction of my colleagues' history here at Guildford Cathedral, but as many of you have been encouraging and observing, I feel so glad to be somewhere that feels like the right place and time for me. I love being here, and I'm very grateful to God. Whether in a parish or a cathedral, talking about Christian giving can feel awkward, can't it? We know that there is a prevailing cultural reserve which inhibits us from talking together about money. However, I want to set at least my reserve aside today and share as directly and as succinctly as possible what the Church's teaching has been around financial giving. The Bible is full of texts about the generosity of God and that's where all this begins. So we read about the ordering and the beauty of God's world. Harvest provision for God's people's physical needs, even manna in the wilderness when they had gone astray. The gift of life itself, breath, comprehension, speech, skills and talents, relationships, love in all its forms. The giving up of God's own self, God's own essence in Christ, at immeasurable cost that we might know the life of eternity in this world and the next. Not for nothing is this the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. God loves and gives so that we might have. Then there are Jesus' parables of the widow's might, the sower, and this morning, providentially, the actual set gospel of today, the parable of the talents. And then lastly, we read of the pooling and the sharing of wealth and possessions in the early church. There isn't time today to elaborate on the full huge story of God's generosity, but you know we have another 364 days of the year to do that. The key thing now is the response to the prior, the all-initiating generosity of God. Giving is God's way, and when we do it, it's an act of worship and thanksgiving. Of course, we're giving back to God, as Stuart already said, what has always been God's to begin with. Actually, we could say that the question has less to do with what of our wealth we offer to God, and more to do with what of God's wealth we keep for ourselves in face of God's generous provision for us. So how do we go about this? What might this look like in practice? There are three key principles from scripture and tradition. The first principle is that our giving, our offering, is regular and planned. It isn't casual, occasional, or an afterthought. 
It's not about our leftovers, what remains in our pocket. Some churches even teach that giving is the very first item of expenditure, giving to God's work before we spend on anything else at all. And they derive this from St Paul's commendation of the Corinthian Christians, who support neighbouring Christians because they are, in Paul's words, giving first to the Lord. First to the Lord. And if this sounds challenging, well, it's because it is. And I'll leave it to you to ponder what that might mean for you personally. If the first principle is that our giving is regular and planned, the second is that it is proportional. As many will know, there are texts in scripture which speak of tithing. That's giving to God 10% of what we have. And long-standing Christian teaching refers to this. Some churches take it literally. Others use it gently to highlight the principle of a percentage. Proportionality is scriptural. Indeed, it's reflected in this morning's gospel reading. Those to whom more is given are invited to offer more. Those who have less are invited to offer less, each in proportion to their resources. In recent years, the Church of England has specifically asked regular worshippers to view the tithe as the amount of their total outward, if you like, charitable giving across all causes, but then within that to consider giving half of the tithe, so 5% of income, to the local parish or congregation. And I know that some here worship regularly in more than one church context, but working on the basis of 5% to local church, however that falls to place for you, might be a useful starting point. A marker by which to ponder at this time, including when Graham follows on from me shortly. And then after regular and proportional giving, we come to a third principle, less of giving, more of offering. Some traditions use the word sacrificial. Those of us presenting this morning talked about that word, sacrificial in our planning and we recognize that there is a danger of it feeling a bit pressurizing or overbearing. Nevertheless if we barely notice our giving what does that say to the one who calls his followers to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him? It's obvious I think that regular planned and let's call it costly Christian giving will mean that we have to sacrifice our desires to spend money in other ways there is a tangible cost to us. But, and here's the thing, there's also an impact for good through the church community, in this case, our cathedral. So there we are, I think that's about as brief as I can make that part today. We, you and I, because like you, I'm also a giver to the cathedral, that's right. We are invited to consider our offering to be a response to the generosity and grace of God, built on three principles of giving regular and planned, first to the Lord, proportional, a deliberate considered percentage calculation, and sacrificial, or if you prefer, costly with real impact within the church that we belong to. Does any of this negate the value, the commitment, the sacrifice of our other existing giving, including of our time and talents? No, not at all. All our commitment to the cathedral is welcomed and enormously appreciated. It's just that today, it's right to consider our financial offering separately and on its own terms. For generous financial giving is an act of worship and thanksgiving. Giving is God's way. Thank you, Stuart, Anne and Chris, for your words. I am Graham Norton, involved here as a member of the congregation for over 30 years. My eldest son, Michael, was a chorister here until 1999, prior to his death a year later. He loved this beautiful place, as do my wife and I. We feel heavily invested here. So what are the ways we can give to Guildford Cathedral? Stuart has already acknowledged there are separate pathways for particular projects. This cathedral only survives because of the time, talents and financial support we receive, and we are very grateful for that. However, if you are able to review your commitment to general congregational financial giving, there are several ways you can do so. In all this, perhaps we can ask ourselves 
When was the last time I reviewed my financial giving to the Cathedral? Has my income changed since I last did so? If it has increased, should my giving increase? The main route for giving to the Cathedral is through the National Parish Giving Scheme. You can sign up online or make a telephone call. The contact details are towards the front of the service booklet, inside the front cover on page two every week, and they're there today. You can make one-off or regular donations to the scheme, and vitally, we can claim back gift aid. You can give either by direct debit, credit card, debit card or Apple and Google Pay. The scheme is confidential and is administered for us by Charles Martin, a member of the congregation, who apart from the Cathedral Finance Manager and our Head of Development is the only person who can see how much you and I give. If you are not already giving to the Cathedral, this is the best way to begin doing so. The scheme helpfully provides an option to inflation link your giving. For those who have accepted the inflation link, the annual increase happens on the anniversary of the first donation. So the increase is about to happen for those who joined the scheme at the outset in late 2015. An April starter will see the increase next April, reflecting the Consumer Prices Index for the preceding 12 months. If you feel led this morning to give financially to Cathedral, in other ways, you need to contact the Cathedral's Head of Development, Nicola Pratt, who works in the Cathedral office. She can help you to make a one-off gift, including, should you so feel inclined, eventually leaving the Cathedral a legacy. The website also has a donate button on the front page, which is very simple to use. We are aware that the run-up to Christmas involves seasonal expenses. We would be delighted if you were able to make a decision quickly. It would be wonderful. But we imagine that many may want to take a little time to consider their response. Perhaps the 1st of January is a good time to bring a new level of giving, or the beginning of the new tax year. To assist with budgeting would, though, be so helpful to know what people intend doing. You will therefore each be offered a pack on the way out of church today, and it will also be made available electronically. The pack will include details of how to give to the cathedral and a pledge form, and you'll, you'll be able to let us give you, us uh, your response. Today we are principally asking you to make a fresh financial pledge. Within the pack there are, we are handing out today is one form for the financial pledge and a separate pledge form if you are able to offer some of your valuable time and talents. We would be very grateful if you could return the pledge forms to Nicola Pratt, our Head of Development, by Sunday the 10th of December, including if your response is that you are unable to do any more than you are currently doing at this time. Thank you very much. I'd like on uh, all our behalf to thank our members of the, of the plan giving team for their time and what they've shared with us today. I was reflecting as they were talking that um, in uh, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7, if my memory is correct, there is that wonderful verse, God loves a cheerful giver. And in fact, again if my memory is right, the Greek uh, behind the word cheerful which is really hilarious. Uh, God loves a hilarious giver. And I have to say, in my almost 50 years of ordination, I've never seen anybody putting something into the collection plate or the retiring collection bursting out with laughter and joy. It is a serious subject, but please could you approach it with perhaps some laughter and some joy in your Christian commitment and how you want to support the work of this place. We come now to our prayers.